Hello. Well, my subscribers will already be aware I've been working on this SLO320 Beta 1 NTSC video recorder. And it's behaving, I believe, as though it has a dew sensor or condensation error. So let's just show you that problem. So if we switch it on, it goes straight into eject and runs a heads up and the ready light doesn't come on. And you can't put it down again until you power it off. And I was trying to work on it using the SL0323 user manual, service manual, uh, and that helped me fix a problem earlier. There was a problem with the eject, and I fixed that, but the dew sensor connections are all completely different. So I had sent from America service manual for the SL0320. So now we can uh, find out if I'm right about it being a dew sensor error. Now the part of the board we're interested in is here because the dew sensor comes in on CN3 pin 1 and goes off to some circuitry that I didn't understand. Marked up dew there. Uh, and it's got an oscillator in it for reasons that I don't understand. So uh, let's have a look at the uh, schematics for that part of the wiring. So on the SY24 board. And the key thing is here, let's look at the output from the dew sensor operation. It says here, H condensation for this line. So that would be high, although what voltage high is, probably 12 volts, in the uh, condition of condensation being detected. And that uh, can be found at this junction here. So we should be able to meter that. This is very exciting. So we're sat here on D31 cathode, and that's supposed to go high in the condensation condition. Uh, let's find out if that's true. No. No. So it does not appear that the dew sensor is in operation. Something else is making it behave like this. That's quite disappointing actually. But we do know that the eject solenoid is being actuated. So we can trace back why. So let's just go back and confirm first that the eject solenoid should have a low voltage on that output because the other side is held to 12 volts. So that's CN7 pin 1. So we'll be able to confirm that that output is low. Yes. That's why the, output, the solenoid to eject the tape is operating. We can trace back why that's true. Eject solenoid driver Q4, that is presumably being switched on. Let's look at the base voltage, should be, says 0.8 of a volt on Q4. So we're expecting to see this one, uh, Q4, being driven on. Yes, 0.8 of a volt, like it says. I'm expecting Q14's... Um, Collector to be high, i.e. the transistor switched off. We can check that. Six volts something, yes, that's high. So we need to find out why that's being pulled high. We can go to the junction of R4 and R5 and see the voltage there, see possibly what's pulling it high. Is that high? No. So the eject solenoid is being driven by Q14 being switched off. And that will be switched off presumably because Q14's base is at low voltage. Let's confirm that. Yes. And since that's being fed by resistors from 5 volt, I'll confirm that that's good. But I think we can assume that uh, D11 is conducting. But let's just confirm that that 5 volt is there on R33. So we should have 5 volts there. Oh, have I misunderstood that? Regulated 5 volts comes in on CN2 pin 9. We should have 5 volts there. No! We don't have 5 volts. Well, that would stop the machine from working. Regulated 5 volt out should be on the power supply, CN1 pin 2. This is why 
a real service manual is better than online schematics very often because you can lay it out like this you've got the circuit diagram there and the component layout there and you can find your way around really quickly so I need CN1 pin 2 this diagram tells me the CN1, CN1 along the bottom edge here is that one and pin 2 is right there CN1 pin 2 missing Let's just do a sanity check and have a look at CN1 pin 6. Should be 6.5 volts. 3, 4, 5, 6. Check for 6.5 volts there. Well, 7, OK. So it's just the 5 volt line that's missing. Where's uh, regulated 5 volt derived from? Well, the 5 volt regulated supplies derived from the six and a half volt actually it looks like they just use a couple of diodes to drop about 1.2 volts but it's very odd that the six and a half volt is there and that's fused and the five volt is not let's just check that again pin six six and a half volt six and a half volts a bit high whereas pin two Nothing really there. Well, I mean, there's only two diodes in the circuit. Unless it's a short circuit on the 5 volt rail somewhere. Or a capacitor problem. Uh, not that likely. I really am going to have to take the power supply out because the diodes in question, D9 and 10, are buried under this metalwork just over there. I can get to the power supply. I've undone screws at the top. I think what I need to do is unplug these connectors underneath and hopefully I can get it out enough for me to reach those diodes. Not easy. Okay, we'll have the power supply out. Now we can check these diodes D9 and D10 there. So we'll just meter out these two diodes D9 and D10. D9 forward voltage drop. 0.6 volts and then D10's forward voltage drop open circuit open circuit it's not a dry joint it's actually got an open circuit oh no now it's come back Maybe it was a dry joint. Let's um, resolder those connections. Okay, I've uh, resoldered those connections and cleaned up the board a little bit. Now we can uh, refit all this and test it. Okay, first power up. Wish me luck. That seemed more sensible. Oops. Fast forward. Rewind. We need to work on the rewind. Eject. Good. Okay, let's have a look at this rewind problem. I've got you looking down on the deck. That's the carriage. Head drum there. What I'm going to do is make it think there's a tape in there, select rewind. I wonder if I can get it to make it think there's a tape in there when we have the carriage up. That would be handy, wouldn't it? And then I can see which of these idlers is slipping or giving us the low back uh, reverse rewind tension. So what do we do when it laces up? We know that we've tricked it into thinking there's a tape in there. If I put my finger on that, that'll do it. But what do I do to make it think there's a tape in there uh, that, it, that it's got the carriage down? Ah, there's another one there. Oh dear, I need lots of fingers for this. I won't have a spare finger to press the rewind button. So if I operate that and that 
there we go and now press rewind uh, nothing's happening the rewind lights lighting up and nothing else no that didn't work no I've got it into a confused state now <laughs> switch off and on again oh it's confused now okay that idea didn't work let's just do that and select rewind nope it's not rewinding it's not doing anything it did a minute ago let's put a tape in fast forward oh no something's died We were doing so well. Oh, that doesn't sound so good. It's missed a guide. Uh, there's no real drive. And no head drum rotation. Okay, real drive and head drum rotation come together. So we're not getting any head rotation. That's the fundamental problem here. Did you see that? When I padded up, that span for a moment. Let's do that again. Press eject. No. Power off. Look, it kicked. On, kicks again. Look, I've got it working <laughs> on its side. I don't know why, but now I can get it to lace. If I hit rewind, we get it rewinding. If I hold, I don't know if you can see that, if I hold this reel, then with that held, this tyre here is stalled, that tyre there is stalled, so either that tyre or the one that drives it is not gripping properly. Let's press eject. So either this tyre or this smaller one is the fault. And I don't have, I sure don't have that tyre. I may not have this one. But perhaps I can roughen up the surfaces and see where that gets us. Okay, I've um, used some platen clean on these three idler surfaces. I hope you can see them. So there's one here that... Uh, connects to the take-up spool there's an idler in the middle and there's this one which is I believe the supply spool there is a drive belt here um, between these two but it appears to be in good condition so um, I won't replace that unless I'm convinced it is a, a problem I think uh, we'll just try rewinding a tape at this point Okay, hit rewind. Bit of tape damage. No, it's still not great, is it? Fast forward. Fast forward's fine. Rewind again. Oh. It may be improved, actually. No, I'd say that's definitely improved. These fully laced beta machines were <laughs> never great at rewind. I would say that's adequate. And this is the worst part when you've got this spool full and this one almost empty. That's the hardest time to uh, rewind. So I'd say that's working. Fast forward again. Hit play. That's fine. Eject. Good. Let's try uh, actually playing a tape. Right, let's uh, try it now with a, a tape with a known Beta 1 recording.
I believe the reason it wasn't working earlier when it was sat down was because the conductive path of my anti-static mat may have been across the bottom of the boards and was upsetting the working conditions of a board somewhere. But with the base, the proper base on it, it seems to be working fine. Okay, let's uh, power it up and change the tape. I'm assuming this TV can take NTSC. I'll find out in a minute. Oh, it stopped again. Oh, that's disappointing. It seems to work when it's on its right hand side. Isn't that weird? Oh, there's something funny going on there. And then I can put it down. And yes, it works. I mean, that is really working. Let's try the tracking control. So full to the left, there's some disturbance. Full to the right. Oh, that is a really good picture. I mean, that is stunningly good. But we have this problem that it is intermittent in operation uh, with the uh, head drum operation. So I think we're going to have to debug that problem next. So it appears to not always work when you just power it up, set down here. But if I rotate it to the right, then it will work. Oh, it's right on the edge there. Oh, now it's got a new fault. I think the um, this problem we had before with the eject falling apart has happened again. So that'll obviously need gluing in. Let's uh, fix the eject lever again. Those of you who watched the other parts of this series will have uh, seen me working on this eject mechanism earlier and this is supposed to uh, be stuck together and it fell apart and I put it back together in the machine and reassembled it but uh, it's disintegrated so I will this time glue that pin into the retainer before I reassemble the eject mechanism. Okay, I've uh, reassembled the eject mechanism and the supply spool so that's corrected that error. Let's uh, Try it again. Fast forward. Rewind. Play. Good. I'll do some more testing on that. Okay, so I've had the problem that in its fault condition that sometimes you press a play or rewind a fast forward button the light comes on but nothing happens it doesn't spin the heads or start up and also i noticed that in the fault condition when you power the machine up it goes clonk and when it's in the working condition it kind of goes tick now uh, i did some experiments i was working till two o'clock this morning working on this thing Remember, I was sitting, sitting on its right-hand side, it would usually work. At one point, it wasn't working when it sat on its right-hand side, and that was really helpful, because I was able to prod and poke around with the screwdriver. And I found that if I prodded the board which has the micro-switches, remember we replaced two micro-switches, if I prodded that board with a screwdriver, I could instigate the fault and make it come and go. So these original switches had a slightly different uh, lever height than the replacements that I fitted. So I very, very slightly altered the, the lever. I just gave it a little bit more um, upward tension. I also used my microscope here and went over the whole of that board looking for anything that resembled a dry joint. Now, when we had the problem with the power supply, the dry joint on the diode that was causing the five volts to disappear looked pretty much fine. I couldn't see that it was a dry joint. So, and that's unusual. Normally you can see it. Normally you get a little ring around the solder, but it looked fine. So I went over the, that board looking for anything that even resembled a possibility of a dry joint starting up. And some did have a faint ring. And one or two of the component legs didn't look that well soldered. So I resoldered, oh, probably about 40, 50 connections last night. And since then, it's worked perfectly. 
And I think what I'm like going to try to do is see if I can instigate the fault again by tapping on the board when the machine is sat down, which was the position in which the fault used to come, on, come and go. So let's just have a quick look at that. So now if I power it up, it just goes click, which is a relay by the sounds of it, and everything's working. And the board we were looking at was this one. So I'm going to bring it to the front of my desk and power this down and gently tap on that board and power up and keep checking that it makes just a nice little clink, click and not a big clonk which indicates it's gone into fault mode. Looking good, isn't it? I think what I'll do at this point is reassemble the rest of the cabinet work on it. I should uh, point out here that certain video recorders of this vintage had this really unusual arrangement. You could undo a screw or something here and pull out the RF modulator unit. And the idea being that that was supposed to make the unit theft proof since you couldn't use it without the uh, modulator. So you could just take that away and uh, it operated as a sort of security device, and that was true of uh, Sanyo VTC 9300 as well, I think, had that feature. Seems a bit silly today, but there you go. Also, I will have mentioned on my first video, this has rather strange connectors for the audio. It actually has 3.5mm um, jack sockets instead of phono socket for audio, so I had to make a special cable up for that. I should mention the screws I've used in a lot of the cabinet work here are very unusual. They're slotted rather than um, posi drive or Phillips, but they have a pinhole in the middle. So I guess they had a, a kind of a screwdriver with a pin for locating it in the middle, which is uh, obviously their solution at the time, but why they didn't use normal posi drive, I don't know. When reassembling this kind of machine, it's uh, best to uh, put it into the eject mode before putting the top on because otherwise uh, this component gets in the way. Sony have these screws visible, whereas Sanyo top loaders have a nice sort of rubber strip thing to cover up the screws. So let's test it again. And there it is. Picture and sound, perfect. Now what I can't really show you is just how good that picture is. You're getting a lot of flicker because that's a 60 hertz uh, image and you're watching on a 50 hertz camera. Uh, and unfortunately, because I don't know where this tape exactly came from, I can't um, digitize and show you some because the person I bought this video recorder from has unfortunately passed away. Lovely chap he was as well. Uh, what I can say is that the picture quality is on this screen, it's almost hard to spot that it is coming from an analog tape and not from mini DV. This beta one speed, which was only uh, produced for NTSC machines in PAL land, uh, there was only ever one speed. But this beta one was used in the very early beta video recorders and also on some of the slightly later but professional aimed machines. And of course this is aimed for professional use. There's no tuner timer in this, it's designed for professional use. And I've seen it said, oh, it's well understood that the reason that Betamax failed, if it failed, the reason that Betamax lost was because in the early days, it had a very short running time. And that's simply wrong. In all PAL and CCAM countries, uh, the standard tape you'd buy from the shop in the you know in the uh, early 80s would have been an L750 that ran for 3 hours 15 minutes. Whereas on VHS you'd buy an E180 that ran for 3 hours. So beta actually generally gave longer running times, not shorter. Now it's true to say that the very longest tapes on VHS were a few minutes longer than the longest tapes on beta. But that could have changed anyway uh, over time. 
uh, if they'd done an L1000, which was possible, uh, they would have had, uh, you know, even longer, over four hours on a beta tape. So running time was not an issue uh, for PAL and CCAM countries, and after the early days wasn't an issue on uh, NTSC, NTSC countries either. What, we don't have to go into why beta didn't win, but suffice to say running time was not the problem. Now, this is a wonderful machine. I'm really pleased to have it. There's very few uh, beta one speed capable machines in the UK, I suspect. So it's very helpful that when tapes come in that are recorded on the beta one speed, that I can handle them here in the UK. Very few other people can. So I hope you've enjoyed that. In the meantime, please remember to like, share and especially subscribe. And I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.